Hey, you hear me? Very good. Yeah, I, hope, yeah. I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, I'm Wally Olson. And uh, myself and, and Cinnamon Linhart are starting Ranching.FYI, which is going to be a information uh, website on ranching with podcasts and stuff. And this is the first one. And uh, and this came about by a good friend of mine by the name of uh, uh, Bob Metzger and I uh, were discussing the state of the cattle industry and we decided to ask Chris to come and do this. So, And uh, that is about all I have to say and I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank y'all very much for uh, this attendance here. Uh, my name is Chris Swift. I'm with Swift Trading Company in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a commodity broker. I have been for the past 32 years and uh, looking forward to sharing a few observations with you this afternoon on the cattle industry that uh, I've made note of here recently. So the way I take it, so we'll stay up, be able to stay on track is I have formed the industry into an hourglass. <clears throat> that hourglass being the bottom of it, the center of the plate. I think that's where our beef demand begins is the consumer out there needing and wanting a good quality product. So when I look at the factors and trying to judge whether price of beef should go up, price of cattle should go up or down, I tend to look at the hourglass and dissect each one of these sectors one by one to see if that that where the issues of higher or lower prices may come in what particular sector that we're looking at so the first one we're looking here is the center of the plate and the consumer and the consumer right now has been through a tremendous um, i need to roll the screen okay gotcha. I have to let this keep going. okay go ahead so the first thing we're going to look at with the consumer here is how we are on our employment to population if we look at the left-hand side of our screen here, it goes back to 1980. It gives us a full 30 years to look at. And we can see that we peaked right in 2000 of the number of, of uh, population that we have employed. So that reading at near 65 is a significant number of our population employed. Then we can see through the 06 through 08 timeframe when we had the uh, financial crisis there, we dropped off significantly when the uh, stimulus packages, when the interest rate twists, when those began to take effect from the government, we began to see employment rise again. We look over to the right-hand side of our screen and we see more updated from 2000 to present. We can see right now back the, um, the big drop that we've just recently had this spring. So although we are nowhere near coming back to that level, we most likely are going to continue to creep back up and increase the employment to our population. So the employment factor right now, we're still suggesting from the way the USDA came out at somewhere close to a 10 to 11% unemployment rate right now. We were at approximately four before the uh, COVID crisis hit. So the couple of things in the consumer that I've noticed is their spending habits. It takes approximately six to eight weeks to form a habit or to break a habit. So we noticed that within the first four to six weeks, the consumer quickly adjusted getting their product from the grocery store instead of from the restaurants. We saw shifts in their travel and entertainment. When the airline industry shut down, the cruise ship uh, industry shut down, it left the entertainment business a little bit sparse by not being able to get to those areas as well as a lot of those areas were still not open yet. So we saw significant shifts in the consumer spending. What we've not been able to really tell is by how much that spending has increased or decreased because they are going to different sectors of our economy now instead of what we previously saw before the COVID event. And we here tend to look at pre-COVID factors and post-COVID factors because that tends to be what has caused the dramatic decline in a lot of the prices of our commodities or has given a great big boost to some of them. So the consumer right now, what we're looking at is inflation for the consumer. And that inflation is coming from low interest rates. Low interest rates are there to spur uh, consumer activity. They're there to help the businesses out, to be able to provide low interest rates for the businesses to stay in there. 
as well as liability and prevention costs for the disease or for the virus. So we know that anytime we go into a grocery store, we're asked to wear a mask, we're asked to use hand sanitizer. Those signs that they post all come at a cost, as well as the spacing that, that we're supposed to, the social distancing. And that has begun to impact the, the packing side of the industry as well by having these, uh, by having the COVID liabilities and the preventions out there. So from the consumer standpoint, what we've not been able to figure out yet is, have they really stopped eating as much beef? Are they eating more beef than what they were before? It's very difficult to tell, but right off the bat, I would say that the consumer is not eating any more beef per week at 2.2 to 2.4 pounds of beef per person per week than what they were pre-COVID. Some will argue with me that there may have been a little bit. I think if we saw anything, potentially the quality of the product that we ate might have increased some, but to most, we ran into the hamburger tray. The hamburger tray took off because with a hamburger meat, you can make so many different types of meals. Eating at home, we found out that a lot of people don't know how to cook anymore. So we had to go back to learning how to cook. We had to be able to use the products that we had on hand. And hamburger meat became one of those go-to products that was good, nutritious, and able to fill a, a various different uh, parts of the meal. So with the consumer, we believe right now that the significant changes in home delivery versus brick and mortar establishments, we believe that right now still 20 to 25% of our restaurants, our food service industries, anything that might uh, deal with entertainment or sports related, all those are still shut down. So we have a very low uh, participation in those uh, establishments. Significant changes in the transportation and destinations of travel. I've heard lots of stories where people have gone out, bought uh, RVs, they have bought boats, they bought ATVs. They've done things where they can stay at home more and, and do more things closely related around the house and not have to associate with as many people outside. So we have an increase in meal preparation at home and impacts of employment, working from home, and the subsidies are all going to be determining factors in our, our forward beef demand. Beef demand from the consumer right now, as best as I believe it, is still very good. I don't think it's gonna change much unless we change consumer discretionary spending habits again. So if we recall, we went from normalcy to change to shifting where we spent our money, either on entertainment, on our meals, or on our destinations. This fall, do we revert back to the old ways as the virus either subsides or increases either one? And that's what we don't know. So what I'm gonna watch for when I look at the center of the plate and I look at the very bottom of our uh, hourglass there, I'm looking for changes in consumer discretionary spending habits. So factors that would impact that, higher interest rates, lower employment, possibly more businesses going out of business. Um, those factors right there, right off the cuff would be the ones that I would watch for the most as we move forward. Whether or not the schools open is a, is a really big issue right now because we know that food service to a lot of those schools is enormous. We also know that government programs are large for the impact to uh, the beef market and the pork market as well as the government supplies lots of subsidies for schools, for our school children and our school kids. The fewer amount of kids that are going to school, that is again a shift in where that child eats his uh, meals there. So the things that we're gonna take away from the consumer is that the increase in meal preparation the things that we're gonna look for is changes in their discretionary spending habits. So we move up the stairs and we go to where does the consumer purchase those meals? Where does he buy his groceries? And of course the grocery store and restaurants is our next step to that. And right now the grocery store business is just unbelievable. The, if we look at stocks from Kroger's or from Publix or from some of the other uh, um, uh, corporate uh, 
of the corporate grocery stores, we can see that their stock prices have increased considerably. We saw big runs on meat at the Costco and Sam's Club when the when they first broke out. We still believe that there is considerable amount of freezer beef in personal free, uh, uh, freezers out there. So with that, we might st still see not near as much beef demand as what we could be until a lot of that product is chewed through. Restaurants clearly have taken the brunt of the blow and I'm not sure with your city, but in here in Nashville, we are still at a 50% reduction. The bars have just opened with a 25 person uh, maximum to them. So we're still very, very well behind in our food service and our restaurants and catching up. This is the most crucial to the mom and pop or organizations. Those restaurants that have been able to do takeout, drive through, or fast food establishments have fared a tremendous amount better than your dining in and your sit down. Which brings us to the high end steakhouses. In some areas, they have completely gone out of business and may not ever return. In some areas, they're just waiting it out to see if the governments begin to uh, lift restrictions on their establishments. But what I do think is going forward, regardless of how much the, the COVID virus increases or decreases, you'll begin to see more and more restaurants open up. One of the things that we note is that although restaurants are going out of business, that business will then sell those products and those um, food service uh, ovens, refrigerators, freezers to somebody else at a discounted price. That discounted price will allow the next person to come in, purchase that, and reestablish a restaurant of some kind. So I believe that the food service part of it is, is a very limited time frame. I don't know what that limit is, but I do believe that going forward, we will continue to see more and more food services uh, open back up again. Then we move up the ladder to the packers and the processors. So the packers and the processors right now seem to be in really good shape as far as I know. Capacity utilization of the packer is perceived efficient, adequate, and potentially expanding slightly. So you may or may not remember, but through about 20, the end of 2010 and into 2011, the packing industry was very, very big, and it had much more capacity than it did utilization of those products. And those particular plants found themselves having to bid against one another to bring the cattle into their plant where they would be able to run more efficiently at hopefully 100%. We saw a tremendous amount of plants closed. We saw a lot of mothballed, never to be brought back again. And they became very efficient. At just about the same time, production had expanded greatly from the 2013 through 2014 timeframes. So it, it was kind of a black swan at that time, not although a, a specific event, but the culmination of reducing packing capacity and expanding the herd at literally the exact same time had significant ramifications on the market. And that's why we saw that big decline in 2016 and 17 that we did. And why we've not been able to sustain any rallies yet is because we still have, in some cases, limited uh, capacity for production, I mean, excuse me, for, uh, for uh, uh, slaughter capacity and still have a, a, an expanding cow herd. We, we, I say expanding cow herd, I know that the January and July inventory reports showed about a 1% decline, but in the last four months, we've seen a significant decline in the cow kill. So whereas we were running at four and 5% ahead in cow kill year over year, we're down now about a percent to 2% on that. So we're holding back some cows for whatever reason. I've not seen any significant increases in heifer placement at all. So I know that heifers are still being held back right now. And maybe this fall, we'll see some decisions being made on whether to keep those heifers or send them off to slaughter one of the two. So the packing capacity here seems to be really good. As best I understand, it is running at 100%. Regardless of whether it's pork or beef, either one, these plants tend to be running at 100%. Greater automation is probably going to be something that we need to realize going forward for, for years to come. When the uh, Linney County fire happened at that plant, they came back with significant increases in robotics, 
and, and with technology to improve the number of cattle that can be processed in a day. More of that is going to happen. So I believe that you have a slight increase in packing capacity, as well as with the mom and pop operations. The mom and pop operations are anticipated to continue to thrive even after a lot of this passes. You will see the consumer, I think, go more and more now that they have had the ability to go out and purchase either a cow or a half of a cow or some form where they have become the controller of what they eat instead of the grocery store. A lot of them like that. And, and we note that a lot of those mom and pop places might have a 10, 20, 30, 50 head capacity, but we're still only killing one or two or three at any given time. All they had to do was increase employment. They increased employment. The facility was already elevated enough to handle a slightly larger kill than what they had been. I think that's important to remember going forward because I think you'll see either not necessarily more of them pop up, but I think you'll see them become a, a bigger part and, and it'd be very hard for them to take away any business from the corporate kill yards, but I do think that they will have enough of an impact that they'll be around for a while. So the consumer will have more choices now instead of going to the grocery store, they'll have more choices to be able to find their product elsewhere and, and source it from places where they know that they want to go instead of it being a culmination from all across the United States and even potentially imported. So the COVID-19 related issues will be a constant factor going forward in speed of production. Uh, we're fixing to talk about that just a little bit here um, when we talk about the export markets. And we're going to run right up into the exports right now while we're still talking on this particular sector to it. So I got some information this morning from Australia that's showing about a 66% decline in beef, pork, and chicken production. And the bulk of that is due to uh, the uh, arbitra arbitrators, I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry, the, the slaughter plants over there not being able to have enough employees in there. So they're running into the same problem we did four months ago. Not only that, Australia had within the last eight months gotten a change in their herd. They had seen liquidation for two solid years in a row. And it didn't matter whether you wanted to or not, it was a half to ordeal because you just didn't have the water. The last 12 months have brought in enough rains and enough water uh, retention now to begin expansion. That started just about the same time that the COVID hit. And so we believed even prior to the COVID that Australia was gonna be a little bit lesser in their exports and that potentially the US uh, having the same trading partners as they do would be able to pick up some of that demand in the export market. Unfortunately, we've not seen too awful much of that just yet. Maybe for the next half of the year, we will be able to do that as now Australia's issues have begun to increase instead of decrease. So we know that this, with this uh, decline in the uh, processing ability for Australia, that might lead to a little better market for the US on the, on the short term. So our export markets, although they have not been fantastic, they have been adequate so far, running just a little bit behind last year. The next half of the year, it's kind of, kind of iffy as whether it'll be a whole lot better, but these new factors that we're just finding out coupled with the US dollar having declined sharply over the last six to eight weeks, that too will go a long way in helping in our export markets. So we go up and we look at the feed yards now. So we looked at the center of the plate, the grocery stores, the packers, and we've covered the bottom end of the sector now. Now we go up to the production side of it in the feed yards. Feed yard capacity is, is probably, if I were to say so, it is extensive. We have got a lot of, of feed yard capacity. You may or may not recall, but there was a large shift several years ago from the south to the north, because that's where the corn was, and that's where the DDGs were. And the ability to not have to ship the DDGs south and to just move the cattle north became much more efficient in raising cattle. The last two years, they have had such a difficult um, a weather scenario up north, they haven't been feeding near as many cattle. This year it's a little bit different. So if we take the full amount of capacity in the south 
and now we begin to bring the north back into heavier capacity, I think what we're finding ourselves is all we're doing is, is bidding against ourselves to just like what the packing industry did in order to run at 100% capacity utilization, I've got to outbid the other guy to bring that steer into my feed yard. That's what's happening right now. We are seeing an expanse in feed yard capacity, and I believe that that expanse is now drawing uh, greater amounts of bids out there for those cattle. Whether it will stay like that or not, I'm not real sure. I think a tremendous number of the cattle for this particular cycle of the year has already moved. So we might see a few more cattle out there move, but the feed yards, in, in my opinion, and from what I've seen, are getting pretty pulled up. We had about 11.5 million head on feed last year. We're gonna run at about 12.1, 12.2 million head of feed this time for the July time frame. Looking for an approximate 9% increase on placements and the marketing's still not very good. The marketing issue here seems to be that although the beef is moving and the price of beef has risen from the low 200s to about 223 now, we've seen cattle prices rise but the margins haven't changed much. There's not really any more profitability in feeding cattle or not. And we're noticing that with each uh, projection for the week, for the week's kill, we're falling short of that, anywhere from two to 4,000 head. So in my opinion, were the consumer out there demanding more beef, we know that the packing can side can facilitate that. We're just now killing 644, 650 every single week. We could bulk that up to 660 to 670, I think, with no trouble at all. So I think we could facilitate the, the kill and slaughter needs if they were needed, but, but the packer is doing a very good job at holding those margins where they are. And I think that's why we're not seeing any greater kill capacity come on, is because the margins right now are still very friendly to them. They're trying to improve on the uh, feed yard side, but right now everything's still betting on the comp. If you go in and you place feeder cattle on feed right now, if you don't hedge them against the board, there is just no profit in them whatsoever. So even with the board, the premiums that the board is showing right now, they still, some of them still don't offer any kind of profit potential. So again, back to the feed yard, I think our capacity is very excessive right now. I think that there are more people out there bidding for cattle, trying to bring them into their yard. If I'm gonna be a feed yard manager, I've got to have cattle in my feed yard. That became the attitude and like everything else, all at once, everyone started bidding for those cattle and moving them in. So right now we still have, or believe we have excessive feed yard capacity. So we move up to the stockers and backgrounders. This is where I see probably the biggest change in participation. Um, I have seen a lot more younger generation uh, calling and asking about risk protection. Uh, saying they're taking over dad or granddad's business, backgrounding business. This is a change from the last 10 years. The last 10 years, we believe that the, the uh, population of producers was declining. It was aging greatly and declining as well. But with the advent of the internet and the video sales and the ease of me not having to walk out the door to go sit in a pen for all day long, I can buy cattle when I need to. The younger generation being very savvy with technology can do it even easier. So I believe that that aspect, as well as the time movement of, of stockers and backgrounders in comparison, putting cattle on feed or in a cow-calf operation, you have a much faster rotation in backgrounding cattle. Depending upon the season of the year, you could put 100, 150 pounds on them through the grass season, that only being three months, and then you may have to go five months through the fall of the year or in the wintertime to get the same amount of poundage on them. So with that, I see that that speed of production is very enticing to the younger generation. I can get a faster revenue and cash flow going on that. And I also have the efficiency of my technology that I can use more and more sale barns are going to that, you may start to see fewer and fewer brick and mortar sale barns out there. So that's one of the stocker and backgrounding operations there. Um, everything is dependent upon location and feed sources for their efficiencies. There does tend to be margins out there 
for them as they can go out and they're picking up deals. They may pick up the scragglers where you still have a cow-calf operation that has 10 to 15 head of mama cows and, and you can't put a pot load together on them. They'll go out there and they'll pick those up and they'll build pot loads with those and then they are able to be more attractive marketing into the feed yards. So I believe this particular sector is probably the youngest sector coming on, probably the most aggressive sector coming into there, and, and probably um, creating some of this uh, urgency in the bid as well to the cattle is that they all want to be in the cattle business. So in order to be in the cattle business, you got to buy cattle and you got to outbid your neighbor. So I think that's where we are right now in the, uh, the background. And then we go up to, um, to the cow-calf operation. And this is probably the most interesting, and we'll, we'll touch on this um, a couple of different ways. But the first and foremost, let's look at is, is things that I picked up when I was in Utah last year for the Utah Cattlemen's Association, land and water rights. The, the amount of discussion that was about that overshadowed anything and everything else that was a part of that program. Um, I, I am in no way qualified to talk about anything about that, but I do know that for you, the cow-calf operator, because your land tends to be more expansive, you got more of it, and you have a tendency to have more encroachment on your land because you have either streams that flow through it, rivers that flow through it, lakes that you've got on it, people like to come and do that. So your land and water rights are probably your biggest issue, in my opinion, for the cow-calf operator. Urban encroachment. We see that here in Nashville all the time, although Davidson County is a metropolitan county, we did have a little bit of livestock production. Hobby farming is all it was. Completely driven out now. Um, you had outer lying counties here in the state that were, are still in livestock production, but every time that we see Farmer Brown sell the farm and the three that are around it, that farm becomes real estate and they will put a subdivision, a housing subdivision on it. And the very first ones, they're fine with it. But you get everybody in there and then John's cow gets out, has a car wreck on it, has an accident. Then they begin to say, well, we're not really as fond of this farm being around here. There's more of them than there are of you. And we begin to see greater interaction with the public, government officials, taxes increase, that puts more farms out of business than anything, and then just potentially being elbowed completely out of business as land goes from uh, uh, private to commercial. And then once it goes commercial, then you can start building houses on it, buildings on it, and such. Continual movement towards vertical integration. So if we go back to the center of the plate and work our way forward, we have fewer mom and pop restaurants that suggests to me that the corporations, the Yum Brands, the Darden Family Restaurants, those establishments will gain a greater toehold. If we look at the scale by McDonald's and vertical integration, the ability to have a like product at every single restaurant is crucial. All restaurants want that and that leads to vertical integration. If your operation is not vertically integrated, as much as this may be disliked, I think you need to explore that. We've discussed it among here in the office. I've discussed it with clients over the last couple of years. It is a great desire of vertical integration of the industry. It's very difficult to do because of the amount of expanse and the number of hands that it takes to produce a cow. So it's not gonna be easy. But it is coming, uh, and, and all we have to do is look at the pork and, and the poultry industry and take clues from that, and there's no reason on the sun that at some point in time, you won't see a Costco, Sam's, Walmart produce a total vertically integrated supply chain. Look at what Costco did with their broiler operation. They, they are the number one seller of the rotisserie chicken. They wanted a perfect 3.8 pound bird. And they were getting from everywhere, they were getting it from 4.2 to 3.6, not what they wanted. So what did they do? They vertically integrated. They bought the operation and put it to exactly what they wanted. 
Green Plains is probably a good example of that, of using a vertically integrated. They own the feed, the, the uh, uh, ethanol plants there that produce the DDGs. They bought Cargill's feeding operations. Now they are vertically integrated. They have, the, or to an extent, they have the feed. Now they got the cattle. More likely than not, they source their feeder cattle, and then those feeder cattle producers have to source those from the cow-calf operation. That tells me that it's going to be more desirable to build these strings of cattle out there and build these vertical strings so that my production does not fail. Just simply look at what we saw this, this spring with Wendy's and some of the other establishments. Maybe their vertically integrated supply chain wasn't as strong as either A, they thought, or it was to begin with, because we started seeing some shortages of there. And, and whereas we know that some contracts were broken due to that, due to the issues of that, um, there's some interesting factors there that, that we see that vertical integration helped a lot of those restaurants could keep supply on hand. And of course it hindered a lot of others that had no vertical integration, had no supply chain, relied solely on the front end market and they came up short with no product at all. So with the cow-calf operation, just believe as, as difficult as this is and, and as unpleasant as it may be, I do think that you will need to move towards uh, uh, learning more about vertical integration. How it all works and looks, I don't know. I've seen a couple of different blueprints, um, how it might be done. Um, I'm not at liberty to discuss those, but it, it's interesting to see how it will. and and whether or not you can work for someone else, whether or not you can grow cattle to the specifics of what they want, that's totally up to you. Um, but just look back up again and know that your land and water rights are always going to be under watch and that urban encroachment, even though you may be in a very remote area, people are moving out into more remote areas. And what we have found time and time again is once you get a toehold or an establishment of a small town, that they will keep building on that and they will continue through the uh, a movement of government to either annex certain pieces of property within the city limits, taking you out of the livestock business, anything like that can be it. So in order to stay in business, you might have to eventually go into a vertical integration string of some kind. Another thing that's gonna have to compete with all the time is competing meat proteins, pork and poultry, both are dirt cheap right now. They're probably going to stay dirt cheap because even though we see the slightest amount of turn in hog production, we're going to kill 3.5 or 6 more hogs this, this week than we did this time last year. So pork production is huge. Uh, we know that China is short of pork. We have believed for over two years now that, that China would come in and buy up all the U.S. pork, and they just haven't. So I no longer bet on what China is going to do for that. Um, I don't look at China for any kind of beef exports to increase, especially with Hong Kong now having gone back under Chinese rule. We are breaking more treaties and, and um, uh, situations with Hong Kong than we are building them. So with that, I, I'm not real sure that the cow calf operator doesn't need to pay close attention to what some of that competition is out there and just know that in my opinion, and I've stated this uh, several different times, the, uh, a way to combat that is to put 100% of your land under utilization. So I know that a lot of places, whether it's 40 acres, 400 acres, or 4,000 acres that you're managing, um, there are some acres out there that just aren't doing anything. Put those acres into some kind of production. Make it a small backgrounding lot of some kind or the other. Do something with it where you might have grass-fed beef out there and diversify just ever so slightly so that although you are still, you've got all your eggs in one basket being the cattle market, but if in the different sectors of the cattle market, as in right now, grass-fed has taken off hugely in the market. So maybe participate in some of that something that gives your cow-calf operation another revenue stream other than just those waiting for those calves to be born. I'm sure that's much easier said than done. Um, so we now know we've got all our sectors here that we're looking at. 
Interest rates are as cheap as they have ever been. They, the 30-year mortgage hit 2.73% last week. Rates on the futures market, the bond price has gone down and rates are starting to go up. The world is awash with debt, huge amounts of debt. One of the reasons that U.S. agricultural production is in the shape that it is in is because of cheap money. Whether you want to admit it or not, expansion only comes when you have money. And we did not have really good enough cattle prices or corn prices at the times to expand the way we did. We did them under issues of We've had ethanol production. We, instead of uh, the, the government needed another subsidy program for corn, so instead of raising the loan rate or producing more subsidies, they created ethanol. Ethanol instantaneously created a corn boom that lasted for all of about a year and a half. The lower interest rates came in with expansion, and we haven't seen corn prices much above $4 for the last five years. Cattle prices the same way. We expanded in the 13 through 15 time frame when the stimulus packages and the interest rate twist were going on at a significant rate. Lowering the amount of the price of money allowed it to be borrowed and put back in and they bought more land, they bought more cattle and we increased production significantly. So that's where we stand in agricultural production is interest rates. Now, what if interest rates go up? If you have them fixed, that's fine. If you work off a line of credit or a business um, line of credit, they can go up and they can go up sharply. If that happens, or if you have an adjustable rate, a floating loan of some kind, I would look very seriously into getting as much debt paid down or fixed as I possibly could. If we look at things that are gonna help the producer, we have to look at what's available to us. Cattle prices aren't really available to us. If you don't want to use the futures market in there, then you're really not getting much of anything because all the cash price is elevated from the lows. It's nowhere near to break even. Cattle that are being bought today at 108 and 107 are still losing $20, $30 a head. So this is no big you know, um, venture that we're seeing out there in the cattle prices helping the cattle producer. What can help them is locking in these interest rates. What is available to us right now? It's low interest rates. I'm not telling you to expand, I'm telling you to either pay down some of the debt on there because debt is more likely than not gonna go up. And I know that the Federal Reserve and the government has stated that they will try their best to keep rates low. I believe them, I think they will try. That doesn't mean that they can't. We already know that housing is going up like nobody's business. Mortgage loan applications were up sharply. We also know that the um, interest rates that we have been seeing on the cash side of it there, a lot of it was created through manipulation. The government came in and produced money, bond issues for corporations to borrow so they wouldn't have to sell their stock. All that's been manipulated and if you don't want to call it manipulation, call it whatever you want, but, but the government stepped in and did that. Today, one of the uh, Fed presidents made a statement that said, wonder what the markets will look like if we begin to pull back on some of this stimulus. Those were not the exact words, but the exact words I quoted in my today's commentary. But that gave me a little bit of reserve that said, what if this next stimulus package doesn't go through? That's what this market has, the equities market has been rallying on. And that's what the low interest rates has been trying to improve is to get the economy going. If that doesn't work, then interest rates could go up enormously. We also know that the prices of retail goods because of the COVID liability or prevention of is costs money and I'm going to pass that cost along to the consumer. As long as I can pass it along to the consumer, I'm all right. I'm not losing any more money. But to the consumer, what that does is take discretionary funds out of their pocket. So I've got X amount of dollars to spend at the end of the month. Those are my discretionary funds. 
now those things cost me more out there. I'm not going to have as much left over that I can spend on beef products or higher end beef products. So keep in mind that if rates start going up, you're going to see the consumer have a pretty dramatic change and you will see a tremendous number of businesses have a dramatic change too that have expanded off of lower interest rates. So lower interest rates are a big part of what I look at in the markets because they move and adjust what people can borrow. There's another factor there that is energy. And although energy is not as cheap as what it was being negative $60 in the crude oil, um, diesel fuel prices are still low. They may actually end up a little bit lower before the fall is over with simply because we're not going to increase in airlines and we're not going to increase in uh, ship traffic. And we're really not increasing any in sh export shipping traffic. So I'm not talking about just entertainment shipping. I'm talking about commercial shipping traffic that brings goods, uh, export, import, export goods. So a lot of that is lesser as well. Maybe we see a little bit of softening in there. If we do, then use the lower energy uh, prices to your benefit. If you've got extra storage on farm, you might want to top off the tanks when you see the price drop 20, 30 cents at some point in time. Those type things right there may benefit you more in the long run than hedging might or trying to foresee something that may or might not ever happen. Use what's available to you. So what's another thing available to you? The futures market. The futures market is available to you at any given time. And although at times it may not present a premium to it, it's always there as an alternate marketing source. So Swift Trading Company, that's what we do. Um, I write two commentaries a day, the shooting the bull commentary and the midday cattle commentary. We send that midday cattle commentary out while the markets are trading. So if there is anything pertinent that you need to know while the markets are open that you can still take action to, that's the reason that we write that commentary in the middle of the day. It's generally very short, less than three or four sentences per market on there. And it, and it gives you specific. It's not there to give you all the details. It's there to give you some specifics. And sometimes that specific is there's nothing for you to do today. Sometimes, like today, I made recommendations on there for uh, actions to be taken. Um, I've appeared on a couple of different media things there, and uh, we try our best every morning to get up and, and indulge in as much information as we possibly can, and then disseminate that information out to y'all so that you can make a more informed decision. Um, I think that covered most all of my points. You make me pop up. Yeah. I believe that covered most all of my points that, uh, that I was looking at. So I'd like to open this up for questions. Um, please feel free to write to Wally. If you don't want to write to me, then uh, Wally and I have formed a great relationship over the years. I was able to meet him in person in Nashville here a couple of years ago, and we've maintained that relationship. And I certainly do appreciate his invite to me here. Uh, but we would like to open this up to, uh, to some questions here. And our first one is, uh, with vertical integration, Will it have an impact on market volatility? Yes, it will. Um, in theory, it should reduce market volatility because my supply chain is now fixed. If I cannot achieve the supply, then I'm going after my supplier, not necessarily the market. So in the terms of vertical integration, its intent is to reduce the volatility of the markets. It may not always, and in certain factors, it may increase the volatility to those that are not involved in the vertical integration. Now you're on the outside of the market and you don't have that availability of product coming straight into you. You have to source it in the outside market, which could mean it's even higher or lower either one, whether you're procuring it or marketing it, one of the two. All right, so please feel free to, to ask any more questions and uh, I won't uh, uh, continue too much longer, but, uh, but I'll be glad to, to answer anything else. In the chat box, in the chat box. Uh, in the chat box. So there's a, there's a chat box, um, I think, in there where you can type um, your message in there if you want to. Um, again, take a moment to, um, let me put the, um, the last slide. Can we put the last slide back yeah, up sure. there again? So that last slide, if you'll take just a moment to write my email address down there or our, or our uh, web address down there, 
please feel free to, to contact me uh, in person, uh, write me an email. I always respond to all my emails to it, good or bad, either one. Um, so please feel free to do that. And again, if you have any questions or anything, let me know. Wally, I certainly do appreciate this opportunity and look forward to some more. I have diversification on the family farm. Any suggestions for rotation? There's some grazing guys, just cattle operation. Right? So the question is diversification on the farm. Any suggestions for rotational grazing guys? No, I, I, I am not a producer. Um, believe it or not, I've never owned a physical cow in my life. I've traded millions of them on paper, but I've never physically owned one. We have a farm, it's managed. Um, what I would say is your extension agent would probably have that information readily available on their fingertips for your region and location. Um, some of the alternatives that I have heard other people doing is raising a few calves. They would keep a few calves and background them and feed them out themselves. They would take 10, 15 acres, designate it to it, and then sell it on the open market. Whether there was a local butcher shop around that you wanted to market it to, advertise it to, to the, uh, on the internet for families to, uh, to come and purchase. That's going to be another thing as far as maybe something that you can do. Don't ever hesitate to advertise your farm your ranch on there. Advertising is a, is a crucial part of everything. And what we have known, here's another observation, is how consumers really are attracted to a person, a farm, or an entity. And once they get associated with that, it's very hard for them to break that association. So if you are producing a grass-fed beef product out there, advertise it. These are the things we do to make sure that our cattle are the absolute best out there. And, and don't be afraid to use marketing and advertising. And that's one thing that, that I think the, the industry is probably shy of is advertising marketing. And I know that, that uh, beef.org does a great job of it, but we see very few advertisements in outside areas. And when I look in Beef Magazine and I see that beef is what's for dinner, I already know that. We need to be able to get those advertisements out into the mainstream public and grocery stores right now are one of the best places to do that. And when you have a branded label for your bee, that puts the consumer right in touch with you. And, and that started in Japan several years ago when they started putting the picture of a farmer on there. That consumer associated the, the quality of that product with that farmer, and it made a connection, it made a personal connection. That's what I think that would help a lot of people uh, in the industry there is getting the consumer, help the consumer make a personal connection with your ranch or with your farm. So another question, um, the only thing we know for sure is value of gain. All the rest is speculation. How do you use the information of value of gain to advise people? Um, I don't, I, I don't use those, um, it's a great question. I, I don't use those specifications to, to depict whether the market's going higher or lower. Um, again, I'm not a, a producer, so I do not know all of the aspects of production and the gains to it. And I do know it varies greatly, uh, to region, time of the year, feed availability out there. Um, the things I use is everything. I use technical information. I, I try to read the Elliott Wave theory into my market. I try to look at the fundamentals. Uh, clearly, the fundamentals are probably the most difficult because you have on one hand seemingly a very large supply of product on hand with limited markets to, to market that product through, and yet you have the price going up every day. So I can't always explain what the fundamentals are and, and we always go back to one of the age old attitude, a, adjectives of the market can remain irrational for much longer than we can remain solvent. And although that is a very cheap way out, that's what I think is happening right now is that we, we just really don't know why the price is going up other than some of the things that I stated earlier. So when we go back to the hourglass and we look, who's bidding up for these cattle? It's cattlemen, that's who's bidding up for. Them. So we're not seeing that same issue in the beef market. Now, beef prices have risen a little bit, but we note that, but the kill hasn't increased. 
that's a change in the margin. That's not greater beef demand right there. That's a change in the margin. So that's one thing that I probably see out there in that is that with the, uh, with the information that we're seeing, we're seeing cattlemen bid against cattlemen to bring that inventory into to my lot so I can run at 100% capacity, but we're not seeing those same things over in the packing side. Um, you suggested we might want to get ready for vertical integration. Not my preference, but wondering how we might prepare ourselves for it coming. We don't know yet because the blueprints have not been solidified. In my mind, the way I would see it as either a branded beef label or a restaurant that you are going to want to be associated with. And, and you might not ever know what that restaurant is, but the size of your production will mean a great deal. If you have quality cattle and you run the same cattle, uh, same herd, and you keep it all the time, you are going to probably appeal to more individuals in that strain. Um, there are some large producers out there that not necessarily have control, but they have the wherewithal of all the sectors. And all they're looking to do is put those sectors together. A sector could represent a half to a million head of cattle out there but they're scattered in various difference from feed yards to backgrounding yards to cow-calf operations. So when we look at McDonald's and the King's Ranch and what they have done with, with the McDonald's part of it, take some hints from that and, and tell yourself that if I want to be part of vertical integration, who do I want to be with? I think that would be a very important part. Instead of them coming knocking on your door, you might go knock on their door and you might go up to the next step, the, the next individual. So, so when you get ready to market your calves, if you market on a video sale, note who buys them, see what ranches buy those, and then see where those cattle are tracked to and where they may end up at. I think that'd be very interesting to see where your cattle wind up. And if they're not winding up in a place where you like, and you say, well, there's more premium, if I could market into this market, that's the one you're gonna go to. Our next question is, um, thank you for your honesty. We have a very unique operation. We supply our beef to our family restaurant. Thank you for your advice. You are more than welcome. Uh, I jumped in late, so maybe I missed it, but there are ways to, but are there ways to use futures markets to lock in margins on stocker cattle? Taking an animal from five to seven and protecting yourself against a price drop in those three months? Yes and no. <laughs> We believe that all ships rise and fall with rising tide. However, the futures market calls for a 750 to, excuse me, from an 800 to 900 pound steer in the feeder market. There can be great deviations and demand for stockers over feeders or feeders over stockers at any given time. There is no way to hedge the stockers for it because they are not of the same weight. There are ways to manage that that I will not go into because I don't want to create any specifics uh, out there because everybody's operation differs. But what I'll tell you is take the time one afternoon to call me. I'll discuss with you what can and cannot be done and I will give you ideas and I'll show you what those ideas uh, will uh, culminate to in the future. Profits, losses, risks that you have to assume, and then you can make a more informed decision from those. Uh, what is the outlier that will cause the largest dislocation that has the best possibility of happening? What is the outlier that will cause the largest dislocation? Uh, I'm not sure what that dislocation is. Um, uh, so maybe re-ask re that question. What is the dislocation um, that, that we're looking at here? And, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of outlier. The factors that I'm looking for right now is a, a greater increase of the COVID sickness. We send the kids off all to school. The kids get sick. They come back home. They get the parents sick again, and we have another outbreak. That begins to impact the packing capacity. That's what I think could happen. 
if I were gonna put a list one through five, what the things are, that would be the very first one. Another recurrence of, of the COVID factors that would impact packing capacity. I think that would be the very first and foremost thing. Um, right off the cuff, um, I think just going into the fall of the year where you will see greater numbers of people go inside because the weather is not gonna be near as pretty to be outside on and you'll have much fewer Christmas parties. You'll, you won't have the same um, employment that you have uh, in the past that you have now. And if you don't have another stimulus package, those that are without a job or those that are without a, or with a lesser job, they just won't have any more. And that seems to be a fairly large percentage, and I'm afraid to guess, but that could be two, 3% of our population right there that, that without another stimulus package or without a, an increase in employment, then it, it could be very bad on them. Um, dislocation of pricing. Uh, dislocation of pricing. Um, dislocation of pricing would be would vary in regions. Here in the southeast, um, we've had an excellent grazing season. We're going to be able to keep cattle on, on pasture for a lot longer than what you are in Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Wyoming, and the range countries where you're where you're burnt up. That could create. So we're still not ripping and roaring here um, because we still got plenty of grass, but we're seeing a tremendous amount of cattle move out west right now because of the drought. So drought and location regions are probably the biggest thing that dislocate um, prices um, from, from one region to the next. Uh, that, that would be my first, first thought of that. Uh, can you explain the 50-14 negotiated cash price being discussed and how that will affect producers? No, I cannot. I do not understand it to myself, and, and I do not pay that great of attention to that. Um, so, no, I cannot answer that question. But what I will do is I'll try to find out that answer for you, and if you will contact me, uh, I'll, I'll will connect you with the person that does know about that. Give me a quick summary. Are calf prices going to fall, go up, or remain the same going forward? Um, well, let's look at our demand from our backgrounders, which we have a lot of backgrounders out there right now that want those calves. And we have very, very cheap feed out there right now. So I would have a hard time thinking the calf prices were gonna go down harshly because of either one of those reasons. I have plenty of bidders out there for them and I got really cheap feed. Cheap feed wants the longest growing cattle that we can get out there to put those pounds on at the least amount and put the most pounds on them for the least amount of dollars. So calf prices, uh, knowing the fundamentals that I do right now of the cheaper feed, having ample plenty of hay out there, um, I can see where, where we would see calf prices probably remain uh, at least elevated going into the fall of the year like everything else, because we believe all ships rise and fall with the tide, easily if everything else starts to go south, you could see, see the uh, calf prices go south as well. Maybe not to the same extent, clearly because of the cheaper feed. That's another reason why the feeder cattle are in a little bit greater demand right now, is we believe that we're gonna have cheaper feed. We might. Uh, I, I think that corn prices right now are still in a bear market. I think they'll remain in a bear market this rally that we've had here in August is a little bit abnormal. A lot of uh, comments have been that we're gonna bottom the grain markets early. I don't believe that with the amount of product that's on there. And I know that Iowa's had a very difficult time, but that one state, even though being one of the bigger ones, they're gonna do other things. They'll either chop that corn for silage, they'll actually shell some of it, or they'll put electric fences up around it and they'll throw cattle out in it. So it will not go to waste, that's what I do know. Um, and I think that's all the questions that I've got right now, and, and I've run probably a little bit over my time. So um, thank you all very much. If you do have any more questions, please feel free to contact me directly uh, at chris.swift at shootingthebull.com. And uh, on behalf of my partner, Chris Winward, and my assistant, Sean Gammon, thank you all very much for this.